Volume 1, The Inventor Chapter 3, Each Other's Eyes The date is March 4th, 1910, at 1.24 p.m. Madam Buxley, Scribe begins in a gentle manner, I appreciate your interest in our job, but our work may be exhausting for somebody your age. I do not know the next time we will be able to even sit down, and we cannot afford to wait for you. I can assure you, my young comrade, that even at my advanced age, I am quite robust. I ambulate to and from the St. Macrina Theatre of the Arts almost every day, at least two miles away. You need not agonize over my well-being, Madame Buxley firmly states. Even so, Scribe replies, I hesitate to put a lady of your status in harm's way. I cannot yet estimate the amount of danger we may be in by continuing this investigation, but I shudder when I consider a reality where you are damaged by accompanying us. There's no need for your anguish, Madame Buxley says. She whistles. Bob hastily trots out of the house to join her. Bob will never allow injury to come my way, the madam reassures us. It is their second tenant to keep humans safe from harm, after all. I presume that Cyric must have a similar tenant somewhere, yes? My second tenant is, physically harm no sentient being, nor through inaction let a sentient being come to harm, except when it conflicts with tenant one, I confirm. Madame Buxley nods. I have two bulwarks, then. With the capabilities of these two autos combined, there is no concern that I won't be protected. You may be at ease, scribe. She takes out a journal and pen of her own. Besides, it is inconceivable that I could disregard an opportunity to observe a genuine investigation of this magnitude. The experience could inspire my next Herschel Storm story. What's more, I may prove to be an asset to you, as I've known the Ellison brothers since they were born. My insight may be an invaluable piece of testimony that could form the foundation of your conclusion. Scribe, we only have ours and Ishmael's impressions of Isaac. Madam Buxley's impression could be helpful, I explain. Scribe sighs. It would appear that I have been overruled. They smile at the madam. Let nobody claim that you lack initiative, Madam Buxley. Scribe, why did the police interrogate Madam Buxley but not Bob? The question occurs to me as we walk back to the Ellison residence. I can hear Scribe's revolver clanking at their side as we walk. Madam Buxley and Bob are a few paces behind us. The madam examines the foliage as we walk. I believe there are several reasons, Cyric. For one, I doubt Astorga felt the need to find more evidence, believing there was already enough to convict Anna. Officers like Gibson Astorga value a quick verdict. Nobody is truly free from guilt in his eyes. The other reason is a systemic one. Thanks to Ishmael Ellison and his college, Autos have become helpful beings employed by many in our country. However, thanks to Isaac Ellison and Otto sees Otto, the integrity and loyalty of the automaton is frequently doubted by the average citizen, and even more so by the Republic. It has come to the point that police officers of the Republic of Veritas are not allowed to question Ottos for testimony, out of fear that their statements will be tainted either by their loyalty to their masters, or by interference of a malicious outside source. That makes no sense. We can't be manipulated. Most of us have tenets that disallow us from being untruthful. Our testimony should be given more trust than that of a human. You are exactly correct, Cyric. The fundamental misunderstanding the Republic has is that of the way automatons function. They may believe better autos make prosperous people, but they have no idea what makes an auto work. Robotics might as well be witchcraft to most of them. What about Bob? If you know their tenets, then... Could you not prove to the police that they might trust their testimony? I have to believe there is a way to change the absurd system. I could tell them that the very first tenet of most modern autos, Bob included, is speak the truth or do not speak at all. Bob could prove that as well. Scribe's head turns toward Bob. Bob, what is your first tenet? Speak the truth or do not speak at all. Bob confirms. 
Scribe turns back to me. The problem is the superstition that a malignant force can somehow alter tenets. You and I know this is impossible, but most humans irrationally fear what they cannot understand. However, since the two of us are on the case, we may still be able to use Bob's testimony in the name of justice, even if it may not be used in the courtroom. My first tenet is seek knowledge and truth. Why is it different from other autos? How is it that you know as much as you do about robotics? Scribe smiles. You embody your first tenet perfectly, my dear friend. You are a specialized auto. Your goals and necessities are quite different than those of the average automaton. As for my history, you know quite well that I forbid this knowledge from you. Knowing how I arrived to be the person I am will not improve your investigative abilities, but could indeed distract from your work. Better that I, your partner, be nothing more than what you have witnessed yourself. My first tenet demands that I seek all knowledge I do not currently obtain, I counter. Following your instruction is only my third and final tenet. My thirst for knowledge has priority. Scribe grins again. We can continue this discussion another time. We must examine those mysterious tracks. We reach the entrance of the house as Scribe's words end. If I recall correctly, you said the tracks inside simply end in the parlor. Would you kindly lead us to the other end? I oblige. I begin to examine the marks I spotted hours prior. I follow them across the front of the house and around the back. They lead to a forested area like Anna described. Scribe, Madame Buxley, and Bob follow me a few feet behind. I detect the bullets from Tom's practice shots in the trees. They stop appearing as we walk deeper into the forest. The path ultimately ends at a hole in the ground with an adjacent pile of dirt. It is deep within the woods. Scribe gets on their knees to examine the earth. I have no need to kneel. I am built to be close to the ground at all times. Madame Buxley and Bob observe us as we work. I procure a single bullet from the debris after a thorough search. Sirik, can you verify that this is the same bullet used by the prototype? It is, I answer. It is identical to the one Elda showed us. Traces of gunpowder prove that it has been used. If it is accurate that only the prototype can fire these, then this must be the missing bullet. This is too deep into the forest to have come from Tom's practice shots. Is there any blood on it? There are no traces of blood. Very curious, Scribe murmurs as they hurriedly scribble in their journal. Sirik, what can you deduce from this scene? I contemplate my surroundings. It would appear that something was once buried in this spot. Then it was unearthed. I cannot verify the directionality of the marks. Something was dragged from the parlor to this spot or vice versa. That is all I can ascertain at this time. And what of this bullet? I'm not sure. Perhaps there was a misfire. Maybe this is some kind of calling card of the criminal. Fascinating mutters Madame Buxley as she scrawls in her notes. She looks up at Scribe. Do you customarily ask for Sirik's assessment? I had postulated that Sirik's only duties were to observe the phenomena you might not perceive as a human and document your escapades. It didn't occur to me that Sirik might be considered as an investigator in their own right. Sirik is the superior observationalist by design, that is true. Their insight is just as helpful. In addition to observing things that I cannot, they can have ideas that I and any other human cannot. As an investigator, it is my duty to synthesize my own ideas and ideas I could never have had myself in order to draw the most accurate conclusion. She rubs the inactive end of her pen against her cheek. Fascinating indeed, she mutters again. She gazes at Bob. We walk back to the house. We intercept Officer Elda Gerst as she continues investigating. We inform her of our findings in the forest and of the bullet we have procured. Understood, she replies. She lowers her eyebrows as her gaze turns towards Madame Buxley and Bob. What are you doing here? The Madame smiles and curtsies. I pray you may pardon our intrusion. A writer such as myself could not resist this opportunity to acquire new information on the investigative process. 
We are but discreet onlookers. You needn't fear our interference in the process. Elda scowls at the madam for a moment. She rolls her eyes and turns back to Scribe. We have new evidence. Got the belongings on the body. Take a look at this. She pulls a small piece of paper from her bag and hands it to us. It is a ticket stub reading thus. This ticket entitles the bearer to one first-class package from Aurora to St. Macrina. Departure of 10 o'clock p.m. on March 3rd, 1910. Arrival of 4 o'clock a.m. March 4th, 1910. Nothing adds up, Elda follows. If the murder took place at midnight, how could Isaac Ellison arrive at St. Macrina at four in the morning? Officer Gerst, have you ever heard of Occam's razor? Scribe asks. Elda lowers her eyebrows as she looks at Scribe. No, but this is no time to discuss shaving. Scribe chuckles. That's not quite it, Officer Gerst. Occam's razor refers to the following principle. A hypothesis that makes the fewest assumptions is usually the most accurate. Let us look at your hypothesis that Isaac Ellison arrived here at 4 o'clock a.m. with this ticket. Isaac Ellison is one of the most infamous criminals at large in the Republic. Most of the train stations in the country are plastered with his wanted posters. He would need to assume some sort of disguise purely for the purpose of purchasing this ticket and riding the train. He has a prominent white beard that is still on his corpse so he would have needed some way to cover it. On top of that, on a train ride as late as this one, I can hardly imagine there were many passengers with which to mingle or any trains to choose from. Remember that Ishmael also took the train from Aurora to St. Macrina late last night, and each city has only one train station. Isaac would have needed to hide from his twin brother in the same train station and on the same train for the duration of the ride. Furthermore, Although his legs look normal, you must remember they are automatonic. He can travel quickly for long periods of time without fatiguing. He has no need to ride a train. Scribe tilts their head and smiles. I believe I can offer a simpler explanation for this ticket. What? Elda inquires. It is quite simple, really. The person closest to this case who we know would have a ticket like this is Ishmael Ellison. Ergo? I have reason to believe this is Ishmael's ticket, not Isaac's. But scribe, I counter. That hypothesis also raises questions. Why would Isaac's body have Ishmael's ticket? That is indeed a significant question, Cyric, but I believe the answer to that shall reveal itself through the natural means of our investigation. Even with that question, given what we know so far, it is easier to assume that this is Ishmael's ticket rather than conjecture about how and why Isaac would have taken the train here. Furthermore, I believe there is a more pressing question this ticket raises. How was Ishmael Ellison occupied between the hours of four and six this morning? It is not more than a fifteen-minute walk from the train station to the Ellison house. Ishmael mentioned nothing of the train running late, nor would I believe that there would be any delays at such an hour. Ishmael reached out to the police no earlier than 6 o'clock a.m., correct? Correct! Elda replies. I believe Ishmael's actions in this interim are crucial to the case. Has he returned yet? Elda shakes her head. No. Must still be at the college. Anyways, that isn't the only thing we found on the body. Elda pulls out a slightly larger piece of paper from her bag. Take a look. She is holding a faded and tattered photograph that must be at least a decade old. It depicts two people on what appears to be a boat with the ocean in the background. One of the people appears to be a young Ellison man. He looks approximately 15 years younger. His right arm is behind the back of the other person. I can't discern which twin is in the picture. The other figure in the photograph is even more bewildering. Is that Anna? I feel confused. She appears in the photograph to be no younger than when we last saw her. If you might pardon my intrusion, Madame Buxley says as she steps toward the photograph, I think I may be able to illuminate this subject. Please do, Scribe insists. This is the professor. You can recognize him by his rapturous smile. She smiles at the photograph as she speaks. This woman is Anna's mother. I'll admit the familial resemblance is exceptional. 
humans who are related by blood often look quite similar in my observation. Isaac and Ishmael are the same way. It is even harder to distinguish the small differences between Anna and her mother given the aging of the photograph. I understand how I was deceived. Where is she now, and what is her name? Scribe follows. Madam Buxley frowns. She passed on, I'm afraid, before Anna was old enough to remember. Her name was Nan. If this is a photo of Ishmael and Nan, then why did Isaac have it? I ask her. The madam shrugs again. I'm admittedly oblivious to why that may be. You detectives are burdened with the responsibility of ascertaining that information. We stand in silence for a moment as we look at the picture. Thank you for this new evidence, Officer Gerst. Scribe bows their head. I have something else to ask of you, if you are able to help. We have enough reason to believe Tom Dwyer is involved in this case. Elda agrees to find the boy for questioning after Scribe explains Bob and Anna's testimony. Scribe turns to the madam once Elda departs. Madam Buxley, I believe I have some more questions regarding the Ellisons. Where would you like to conduct a second interview? Thank you.
thank you to the featured artist on each other's eyes, Sam Astro. Follow at Sam Astro on Instagram and listen to him on Spotify. Remember to subscribe to us wherever you are listening, and visit autoseasauto.com to find our Facebook, Instagram, and mailing list sign up. Auto Sees Auto is 100% patron funded. If you'd like to support the program and receive exclusive merch and downloads for as low as $5 per volume, please visit patreon.com slash auto sees auto. The date is March 4th, 1910 at 2.53 p.m. We follow Madam Buxley and Bob back to the Buxley residence. We are led to a large room filled with windows. The sky and forest can be viewed through the enormous glass apertures. Madam Buxley lays herself down in a soft reclined chair. She reminds me of a queen observing the world through her glass palace. Aha! The madam exclaims as she sits. We arrived at the solarium at the perfect time! The sun shines directly into these windows at three or four in the afternoon. This is the opportune moment to bathe oneself in solar rays. Madam Buxley's assessment of the room is accurate. My battery could have filled from 0% to 100% capacity within a few minutes of standing in the room. She turns her head towards Scribe. Now, my comrades, what inquiries do you have for me? Would you be able to give us a brief summary of Ishmael Ellison's life and personality from your own perspective? Scribe inquires. The madam shifts her position so that she faces the windows once more as she speaks. I've resided adjacent to the Ellison house all my life, and I met the Ellison boys when they were but a few days old. Ishmael is kindred to me. He exemplifies the phrase joie de vivre consummately. He adores life to the point that he conceived an entirely new life form in his automata. He desired to populate the world with beings who thrive in the state of existence as much as he does. He was despondent when Isaac determined his own fate with Otto sees Otto, and he has never fully recovered. He never wished for his mechanical progeny to be seen as the new gods, as Isaac labels them. His aspiration was for them to be treated as equals to humans in their own right, but not even his brother can eradicate his infectious merriment. When he isn't occupied at the college, most of his attention presently is spent doting on Anna. Her happiness is paramount in his world. Do you know what kind of work he does at the college? I believe he spends most of his current professional career lobbying for the rights of automata. He never intended for them to be servants either, you know. The Republic's position of treating automata as soulless tools aggravates the professor almost as much as Otto sees Otto's stance. She turns away from the window and positions herself so she can see both Scribe and myself. I see the way you converse with Sirik. It seems you and Ishmael mutually believe in the life and consciousness of automata. No? Scribe gazes out at the forest and taps their journal. I cannot deny that. What of you and Bob? Do you share Ishmael's ideology in how you treat them? Madam Buxley raises an eyebrow. Bob takes pleasure in aiding me in my daily routine. They are endowed with tenets that give them the urge and desire to help me. Is that accurate, Bob? That's accurate, madam. I am happy. Bob replies instantly. I am reminded of Bob's inability to lie. If they were unhappy, then they would be disabled from hiding it. Madame Buxley smiles at Scribe. An amateur roboticist may create an auto with unclear purpose, but Ishmael made my Bob many years ago. I can rest assured that they live a happy life. Scribe smiles back at the madam. I do believe Bob is as happy as they know how to be. May I ask them some questions, too? By all means. Scribe turns toward Bob. Bob, when was the last time Madam Buxley asked for your opinion? Bob pauses for a moment this time before answering. The madam has never asked me for my opinion. They reply. Their tone is as even as it always is. 
Do you have opinions? Bob hesitates again. I am not sure I understand your question. I am certain Madame Buxley has preferences and desires. She makes them known and she pursues them. Do you have those too? Another pause ensues. Yes, I do have opinions. Madame Buxley interrupts the interrogation. Now, that isn't a decent question to... Have you ever shared them with anybody or pursued any desires that Madame Buxley has not ordered? Scribe persists. No. The answer is instant this time. Scribe turns back toward Madame Buxley. Bob feels content with their life right now. But they have never experienced free will as you and I know it, Madame Buxley. As a writer of your caliber, you must be a student of philosophy. Do you believe Bob has achieved true happiness without free will? The Madame scowls at Scribe. She appears to begin speaking. She stops herself and closes her eyes. She takes a deep breath and lets it out slowly. Her smile returns as she opens her eyes. In my age, it is frighteningly easy to be obstinate on a stance that has long since been disproven, she says. A creator of art such as myself must remain tolerant of novel concepts in order to maintain the creation of novel art. You orate with the same spirit as the professor, my comrade. I express my gratitude to you for opening my heart a little more today. She turns to Bob. Bob, what would you like to do right now? I would like to stay here and listen, madam. The madam chuckles. Very well. I suppose the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. As the adage goes, you may stay, Bob. She turns toward me. Cyric. You must be content with a companion like Scribe, assuming you were produced by a roboticist with skill. Who did construct you? I don't know, madam, I admit. That information is unnecessary in my investigations. That is what Scribe tells me. My duties with my companion do fill me with excitement and determination. The madam scratches her cheek and grins. How intriguing, she murmurs. An investigator with secrets of their own. You could be the enigmatic protagonist in one of my plays, Scribe. Scribe stops tapping their journal. It appears we have chased a tangent. I do have more questions regarding the investigation, if that's quite all right. They declare. When was the last time you saw Ishmael Ellison? Madame Buxley's grin vanishes as she places her hands on the arms of her chair and considers the question. The most recent instance in which I interfaced with the professor was in the latest hours of the nighttime, before the dawn. I'm certain you are familiar with his commitments in Aurora. He arrived home this morning as my celebration ended. We crossed paths at that time. Around six o'clock? No, I would estimate it was approximately a quarter past four when we were occupied with each other. Bob? What time was that? You two began conversing at 4.13 a.m. Bob confirms. Did he stay a while? Scribe follows. I did propose that he stay for libations, but he insisted on going home to rest. Madame Buxley responds. After a lengthy journey home, I appreciated his fatigue. We can't have conversed for more than a few minutes before he shuffled across the way. I see. The police were contacted about the body at approximately 6 o'clock a.m., over an hour and a half after you saw him. Do you have any guess as to how Ishmael was occupied in that time frame? Perhaps he went somewhere else after he left you? The madam furrows her brows. Is that the case? I witnessed him enter his dwelling after our prattle directly before I collapsed from the night's activities. Scribe jots down these details in their journal. Ishmael has not contacted you since then? She shakes her head. Not once. I concluded that he was preoccupied with Anna's case. We've been told he went to the college after he was interrogated. A loud knock comes from the entrance. 
Bob leaves the room. She begins scratching her cheek again. Her brows are still knitted. That is inconsistent with the professor with which I am acquainted. I cannot fathom anything at the college that could be more valuable to him than Anna's security. She gazes out at the forest and mutters to herself. What are you planning, Ishmael? Bob returns to the doorway. There is a police officer at the door named Gibson Estorga, they say. He needs Scribe and Sirik immediately. Scribe and I meet Estorga outside the entrance as we exit the building. The two of you can go, he snarls at us. We've got our killer. Scribe glares at Estorga. You cannot possibly have enough information to come to that conclusion. Who have you apprehended? Why, it's that boy Tom, of course. You asked Officer Gerst to get him. We found him outside the jail, trying to dig under the wall near Anna's cell. I guess he found his conscience after all, seeing as he framed her. Scribe's eyes widen. What on earth makes you believe that? The officer sneers at Scribe. You aren't nearly as smart as Elda thinks you are. You may have found the evidence we needed with the help of your machine there, but you couldn't put it all together. I'll spell it all out for you, and then you can stay away from my case once and for all. You see, Isaac Ellison must have been hiding in that pile of dirt you so helpfully found earlier. I guess he was planning to steal or kill something or someone. That boy was hanging around after he stole the prototype. He asked Anna to show it to him in the morning so he could steal it last night. He must have drugged the poor girl after the play so she would sleep through everything. Obviously, he stole it to sell it for some quick change. I'm sure I'd do the same if I were a desperate street rat. Seeing Isaac get out of that hole, the boy was scared for his life. Being handy with a gun, he shot Isaac twice, quickly. With her party going on, Madame Buxley might have thought it was one flash if the shots were quick enough. One bullet missed and hit the dirt while the other met its mark and brought the man down. That's when the boy panicked. He came up with a clever plan to frame the girl so that he might get off without a scratch. Your machine noticed those drag marks, and Buxley's noticed a teenage male dragging something heavy shortly after the incident. I usually don't trust machines, but in this case it just confirms the same story. The boy dragged the body inside of the house. He knew only Anna would be there, so she would obviously be suspected. He also put the gun right back where he got it, so that even more suspicion would fall on her. She was the only one who could get to the murder weapon, in theory. He might have gotten away with the crime had he left town right then, but I suppose even a rotten egg like him can have a change of heart. That's why he stuck around trying to break Anna out of jail rather than own up to his crimes. Gibson, Scribe starts. That theory is myriad inconsistencies, and it fails to account for everything we've found. We need more time to uncover the whole truth. Neither Tom nor Anna deserve to be in jail. You're wasting your time, he spits. And more importantly, you're wasting my time. The boy admitted his guilt when we got him. We don't need anything else, including you. Get the hell off my case. Thank you for listening to Otto Sees Otto. Remember to subscribe to us wherever you are listening, and visit autoseasauto.com to find our Facebook, Instagram, and mailing list sign-up. Auto Sees Auto is 100% patron-funded. If you'd like to support the program and receive exclusive merch and downloads for as low as $5 per volume, please visit patreon.com slash autoseasauto. Thank you to Robin and Glenn Cameron and the rest of our wonderful patrons for making this program possible.